Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Our hymn is number 327, A Word of God Incarnate. Please stand. Proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because of our faith in him, we can come seeking forgiveness and new life. Let us ask God to forgive us as we pray together the prayer of confession, which is printed in the bulletin. It will be followed by a time of silent confession. Let us pray. Great God, your light shines brightly upon us. Some days we light up in return, but other days we blink away the brightness. We go back inside to keep what we're doing away from the broad daylight. Lord, let your light be our life light that helps us see the way, the truth, and the light. Amen. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Welcome to First Presbyterian today. This is your official welcome. 
If you'd like a personal one, uh, put your name on the friendship uh, pad as it comes down the row so that your neighbors will know your name and can greet you personally, especially if you're a visitor. Ed Stock could always say, I see we have many visitors today, but Ed had that presbyopia. You know, he could see all the way to the back. I have uh, a little hard time seeing it. But I just presume that you, we have some visitors with us today, and, and you will indeed find this a warm uh, home church, as Susan Vick uh, talks so much about. Uh, well, pastors will be in the uh, parlor after the service if you'd like to uh, talk with Sheila or me. Uh, Stephen Minister will be in the session room if you have a concern involving uh, Christian caregiving that that Stephen Ministry is. And next week we begin our next cycle of inquirers. That's a three-week thing where we get acquainted and help uh, and with our host couple, Glenn and Lori Dennison, help you uh, learn more about our church and about Presbyterians in general. So we're uh, delighted to have you with us. And, and once again, please feel free, all of you, to uh, participate in the Lord's Supper as we celebrate uh, communion on this uh, Sunday before Epiphany. We're glad you're here to uh, worship with us today. Let us pray. Open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that we may hear your word to us this day. Amen. Our epistle lesson is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Hear now God's word to us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks for pinch hitting for uh, Carol Zafransky. You must be home with that flu or whatever that stuff was that I had for about two weeks. Uh, when Carol's reading, I know she's still kind of new that I try to pick ones that don't have big words in it, but that, that is a pretty difficult passage to read. But I think this one's even tougher, the prologue to the Gospel of John. I, I heard Tom Long read this one time, and Tom Long teaches preaching. And it, he, every, when he speaks, every word is perfect, every gesture is perfect, every thought is perfect. And after he sat down after reading this, I thought, nah, he still didn't nail it. Uh, this p passage is impossible to read. I think it, it's poetic, it's enigmatic, it's got riddles and paradoxes in it. The Gospel of John, the writer is trying to equate God and, and wisdom, or the Word, and Jesus, all one, all coexisting from eternity. Uh, the New English Bible translates this, what God was, the Word was. So listen for the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. 
The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from John whose name, or a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world didn't know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people didn't accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart who has made him known. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> As I said the bad news is my voice may be back. The, uh, the good news is this is Communion Sunday and the sermon's 12 minutes. <laughs> and I hope you will empathize with some of the choir members, some of whom were brave enough to endure this twice. They came and sang at the 830 service. One of you told me about being in a church, I think it was in New York City, where the, uh, the choir sits in a balcony in the back, and they're all professionals, they're all paid choir members, and they said as soon as they finish singing the anthem, they all kick back and open the New York Times and stuff, and, well, until all that talking gets done in the front of the church, so. Unfortunately, you all have to sit up front, so I'll try to, try to you know, do the best you can there. Bones McKinney uh, told the story of uh, his uncle, who used to just like to ride with folks and would wherever they were going. And so one day he came to the capital. capital. Uh, this uncle, he didn't have a name. Uh, one time Bone said he was kicked in the head by a mule. So maybe that kicked the name right out of him or something. But he, he maybe behaved a little differently. But uh, So he, the day he's at the capital, he wanders around for an hour and sees everything. But then the, the pigeons kind of die, bomb him away. And, but he's afraid, it's late in the afternoon, he's afraid he won't get back home. So he decides just to get him a hotel room in the big, big city here. And, <clears throat> Sunday morning dawns, and he does what he normally does, gets spruced up and goes to church. Well, all the churches look pretty much alike around the capital to him, so he wanders in one, thinking it was, of course, a Baptist church. But it had two pulpits. So at first he thought maybe he had wandered into a rich Baptist church. <coughs> but it turned out he had wandered into one of the Episcopalian churches. Yeah, by the way, Bones McKinney defines Episcopalian as a Catholic who flunked Latin. But this Episcopalian priest uh, gets going a little better than, than normal, and, and the uncle is so inspired, he lets out, amen. One of those fine Episcopalian ladies gives him a look. Well, the preacher just continues to light it up. Bones explains, actually, this preacher really was a Baptist, but he had uh, got religion and gone to seminary, and then he graduated Episcopalian, so... But it's not long before this preacher just lighting him up and, and uh, uncle lets out another, amen. That disturbed lady looks at him again. Shh. We don't say that here. Uncle looks at him and says, I got religion. The lady gathered herself up one more time and looked at him and said, well, you didn't get it here. If that's all you expect on Sunday mornings to come here exactly what you were expecting, then we aren't doing very much to expand your horizons. If you think you've got Jesus all figured out, born in a manger, manger taught, healed, suffered, died, raised from the dead, then the writer of the Gospel of John wants to expand your horizons, <laughs> expand them way beyond the third or fourth amen. In fact, as poetic as he is, as masterful a writer as he is, 
John is attempting the impossible to help us understand something that's way beyond human words or, or constructs. In response to who Jesus was, I, I would think most of us would say, Son of God. Being Trinitarians, we might also bring in, well, a Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as you're learning in communion or a confirmation class. And, you know, we might even say, and Jesus and God were one. But John is trying to say something here to the effect that Jesus and God and the Word all are one and the same and all existed from the very beginning of existence. Jesus and God always have been, says this prologue to the Gospel of John. When God created light by speaking it into being through the Word, the Word was there and Jesus was there. Back at that very first nanosecond of God's existence, there never was a time when Jesus wasn't. Is that how you would define Jesus? As cosmic and without limits as God, the very equivalent of God, the same genetic stuff? Or do you see Jesus as son of God who came into the world about the time that the angel told Mary what God was about to do? When Bill Leslie spoke to the Presbyterian men and women of the church, he said, Jesus left home for Christmas and had to communicate with the Father by long distance. And last Sunday on College Sunday, Gordon Sinclair said, uh, you know, Jesus has this great power to reconcile us with each other and to God. And, and he's been doing this, well, since he was born. And of course, that squares also with this prologue to John. After this cosmic before time beginning, he then sets the temporal reference for Jesus to enter our world. John the baptizer will come and he will say, the one who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. So Jesus existed before John, but then comes along after John. I guess one way to explain this is that, that God existed all along. The Israelites had their revelations of God but apparently not quite enough to get a full understanding. And so God, who had been there all along, but humankind wasn't doing the best job of discovering God, so, so God took on human form in the person of Jesus. But that can raise some logic questions. If God became human for 30 years, was there a time when God wasn't in God's heavenly home? Was God not answering prayer during that time? Or if Jesus was God and God was God, was there a time when we had two gods? That flies in the face of monotheism, that God alone is one. In the Gospels, you have sayings such as Jesus saying, the Father and I are one. But you also have statements where Jesus says, the Father is greater than I. You have Jesus praying to the Father and saying that no one knows the time of the end except the Father. The Nicene Creed, which we will say today, goes to great lengths to insist that Jesus is God, co-eternal, begotten, not made. Anything less, they thought, we, and then we just couldn't be certain of our salvation, our resurrection, our eternal life. To me, that creed is trying to stretch my brain beyond where it wants to go. What do you think of when you think of light? Sunlight? Flashlight? Klieg light? Uh, Thomas Kincaid, painter of light, or red light, as in the light that means hurry up and get to the intersection before all the other people do. Or when you think of Jesus as light, how, how would you symbolize Jesus? As, as a candle, as a lighthouse, as a blindingly bright light? In the Gospel of John, Jesus has many I am sayings, including I am the light of the world. In the Old Testament, God, whose name is also I Am, is referred to as the light. Light symbolizes God's truth, God's creative power. Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Psalm 119, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. And in our call to worship today, we cited Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. God's light was already in the world, if you had eyes to see. The light was there 
to be discovered. I presume fire was always around, but it took one inquisitive caveman to discover it, right after another caveman discovered the marshmallow. But, but we human beings have more recently discovered a new kind of light, the LED, the light-emitting diode. This low energy light emitter shines forth a distinctive ray of light. If you drive north on the belt line on, on, near Hillsborough Street, that would be the inner belt line of the inner belt line, you'll pass a billboard over there on the left for the Carolina Hurricanes. I'm not real interested in hockey, but I kept noticing that billboard. Why is that message spelled out in red lights so you know, commanding? And then one foggy day, I was driving the belt line, I could barely see the stop lights or the brake lights of the car in front of me. But I mean, I could see that billboard a hundred yards away. That indescribable red light can cut through the fog. Getting through its most important message for humankind, Washington Capitals, Friday night, buy season tickets. <clears throat> but the LED, a form of light that was there all along, just waiting to be discovered. But it shines in a more vivid way. So perhaps that's one way to wrestle with this concept of Jesus existing from the beginning of God, but not becoming visible to us until his entrance into the human world. God's light was always there for people to see, and they caught some of it, but then maybe they lost sight of it on the phone when they were distracted or blinded. And so God had to make the light put up close in, in human form, walking and talking, God with flesh and bones, as Eugene Peterson, the Presbyterian minister, translates uh, this passage in the, the message, the word became flesh and blood and moved into a new neighborhood. You and I have the ability to perceive all these forms of God's light, God in creation, God present in human form, in those gifted moments when we realize God is present with us, and when we can see that spark of light in each other. And yet it's an eternal truth that's not containable. You can't put it in a box or confine it to the words on a page. It goes beyond our vocabulary. It goes beyond our reasoning. It's something we catch glimpses of, uh, sometimes through a fog, as we meditate on some aspect of God's light. When we come to the table and meditate on the human form of that light, the body and blood of Christ. And when once again we show up live and in person and encounter God in some new way, some, some new color of God's spectrum gets through and dazzles and inspires us. At our house, you can barely see out the kitchen window because of all these things that are stuck to it, little sun catchers and things, and there's one hanging on a, a thin filament. It's, it's actually like a tetrahedron of metal and glass, and it's filled with water. And when the, the sun sets in the west and comes in the evening sun, it, it just goes through that prism and just shines rainbows all over the, the kitchen and dining room. They just dance around the room. And they fascinate me. Now, I remember something about Mr. Wizard talking about you know, prisms and refraction and all this stuff. But that doesn't remove the marvel about how God's light has all this stuff in it. And, and, and the rainbow, you know, sign of God's covenant. And these colors are so bright that even someone who's a little colorblind, like me, can still see the colors. It's light for the blind. With the LED, God gave us a new way to make light, although so far we've only used it to sell hockey tickets. But Jesus was and is a new form of light, the LED of the world. You may not be interested in it, but you can't help but see it. Like a bright red LED, it pierces the fog. It's so bright, even the blind can see it. In fact, the light of Jesus is especially for the blind. So come to the light today, even if you're blind at the moment. The light will get through to you, through taste and touch as we share the Lord's Supper. The current of faith will surround you because of the faithful ones gathered here today. The light of the world that has always been there shines brightly, shining in ways you may have yet to discover. So keep coming to the light, to a new revelation of the one who is the light of the world. And let
let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let us stand and affirm what we believe, saying together the words of the Nicene Creed, the ecumenical version, found on the bottom of page 15 in our hymnal. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. be seated. Our gifts go where we cannot go. They witness to people that we will never meet. They praise God who has blessed us every day of our lives. Let us give with thankful hearts.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask your blessing on these offerings. May they help bring light and hope into the darkest corners of our world. In your name we pray. Amen. Our hymn is number 513. Let us break bread together. Please be seated. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Men and women and youth will come from all over, from east and west, from north and south, and sit at table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Would you join in the responsive prayer of invitation? Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, right to give thanks, thanks and, and praise. Holy God, we thank you for commanding light out of darkness. You spoke light into being. Your word spoke creation into existence. And in Jesus Christ is that same light of creation and redemption. In Christ we have seen your very essence, the power to release us from the forces of sin and death the power to enable us to know you and to follow the way of Christ, the true light of the world. Three in one, one in three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so we lift our hearts in joyful praise, O oh God, because you alone are holy.
Holy God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who lived with us sharing joy and sorrow. He told your story, healed the sick, and was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross and was murdered by those he loved. We praise you that he is not dead, but is risen to rule the world, and that he is still the friend of sinners. We trust him to overcome every power to hurt or divide us, so that when you bring in your promised kingdom, we will celebrate victory with him. Great God, give your Holy Spirit in the breaking of bread, so that we may be drawn together and joined to Christ the Lord, receive new life, and remain his glad and faithful people until we feast with him in glory. O oh God, who called us from death to life, we give ourselves to you, and with the church through all ages, we thank you for your saving love, in Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray now the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, broke it, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this, remembering me.
Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Take and eat. And that night, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink it, do this, remembering me.
you join with me in the closing prayer? Let us give thanks, for God is good, and God's love is forever. O oh God, our help, we thank you for this supper shared in the spirit of your Son, Jesus, who makes us new and strong, who brings us life eternal. We praise you for giving us all the good gifts in him and pledge ourselves to serve you, even as in Christ you have served us. Amen. Let's prepare to take the good news into the world by singing Go Tell It on the Mountain, number 29. Go tell it. Let your light shine. And let your light be so bright, they just can't ignore it. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with us this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.